morning. morning. We welcome you to worship today at All Saints, and we are glad that you are here. If you're visiting, we'd especially like to welcome you. Um, hopefully, uh, you can follow along easily in the service. Um, if you take out the announcements and set them aside for now, everything you need is in these leaflets. So, and also you can ask, you know, the person near you. There is no Sunday school today, um, so we won't have the cross to fall out, but we're glad that you've all come here on this busy weekend to worship with us. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from, from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. You have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. Do not leave us comfortless, but send us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to that place where our Savior Christ has gone before, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God in glory everlasting. Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When the apostles had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will, you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And ye will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven." Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, the Sabbath day journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. The word of the Lord.
reading from the first letter of Peter. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far that you are sharing Christ's suffering, so that you might be as glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you were reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves, keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary the devil prowls around, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, and call, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord.
of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you had give, have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have any of you ever been bullied or ridiculed for things you have said or something you did or believed? It seems that this was a situation that the Christians to whom the first letter of Peter, which we heard in our second lesson today, we're experiencing. First letter of Peter was written around the year 80 and was addressed to Christians living in a wide dispersed area of the Greco-Roman world. And it's clear from the letter that these Christians were experiencing some kind of persecution. And although there is not universal agreement among biblical scholars, the consensus seems to be that these persecutions were not state-sponsored the timing location are not right, but rather these Christians are being ridiculed, harassed, and oppressed by family members, neighbors, and local authorities. In the face of this persecution, the author of 1 Peter encourages his audience to stand firm and wait for a salvation about to be revealed in the last time. Like many other letters and books of the New Testament, Peter expresses the understanding that Christ's second coming was imminent. So his audience just needed to hold on for a little longer. And he encourages them with, praises, with phrases like, humble yourselves, cast all your anxiety on God, discipline yourselves, keep alert, resist the devil. The thing is, Jesus' second coming didn't come during the lifetime of those early Christians and unless I miss something, it still hasn't happened. The book of Revelation uses the imagery of a new Jerusalem where people will hunger no more and thirst no more and where God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. But every time we turn on the news, all we seem to hear about is war and oppression, poverty, hunger, and injustice. It's enough to make us throw up our hands and say, what's the point? Why pray and come to church and volunteer and give money to charity? Why follow Christ at all when it often seems to make little difference in the grand scheme of things? Peter admonishes and encourages his readers because they were at risk of becoming discouraged in the face of ridicule, harassment, and oppression. This is not something that most, perhaps any of us, regularly experience. 
Instead, we are at risk of becoming discouraged because it often seems that what we do makes a little difference. Even though our circumstances are different, I think Peter still has something to offer us today. And I'd like to focus on one of his admonitions, which is discipline yourselves. Because discipline, I believe, can help us in the face of discouragement. The word discipline comes from the Latin disciplina, which means instruction or teaching. However, the word discipline often has a negative connotation since in English it is also used for punishment or enforced compliance. For example, when we talk about Lenten discipline, many people think about giving up things that they enjoy, like sweets, perhaps. But as we know, discipline also means the controlled behavior or self-control, as in show self-discipline. Discipline is not usually easy, Otherwise, we wouldn't refer to it as discipline. But discipline is important. In 1 Corinthians, St. Paul uses a sports analogy. Athletes, he says, exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. How can we exercise discipline in our spiritual lives? I have some suggestions. As many of you know, my training is in exercise physiology and my day job, so to speak, is teaching and advising up the road at Central Michigan University. A major topic in exercise behavior is what we call exercise adherence. That is, what are the factors that make people adhere to an exercise program and what strategies can we use to help people to keep exercising regularly? That is, be disciplined in exercise. One strategy is to have people set aside a specific time for exercise, preferably one that is unlikely to be interrupted. Another strategy is to arrange to exercise with another person or group of people. Others can provide you with encouragement and support, especially when your motivation or resolve are waning. Yet another strategy is to sign what we call an exercise contract that contains a list of exercise behaviors that the individual pledges to follow, showing commitment to following the contract and to keep exercising. These strategies, of course, are not specific to exercise. They work equally well with other types of behaviors, and so, I believe, are good ones to help us be disciplined in our spiritual lives. For example, how many of us pray regularly? Perhaps, like exercise, setting aside a specific time each day to pray will help us be more disciplined in our prayer life. It could be morning, midday, evening, or just before bed, whatever works best. Right now would be a perfect time to start, as we are in the midst of the second annual Thy Kingdom Come campaign, which was initiated by the Archbishop of Canterbury, and which started on Ascension Day this past Thursday and continues until next Sunday, the Feast of Pentecost. Many of you may have seen the video from our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, regarding the campaign which Pastor Kitt posted on All Saints Facebook page. Why is prayer important? Well, as Bishop Curry says, prayer changes things. If you want things to stay, stay the same, don't bother to pray. But if you want to change and you want the world to change, pray. How else can we be disciplined in our spiritual lives? Like exercise, gathering with others, in this case for prayer and fellowship, can help us stay motivated and committed. This is why we, as a family of all saints, gather each and every Sunday to hear God's word and to celebrate the Eucharist. It is not just to make us feel good and give us comfort, in fact, Eucharistic Prayer C cautions us against coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. In other words, we come to encourage and support one another with God's help to live out the gospel in our lives. Eucharistic Prayer C continues, May the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body and one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. What about a prayer contract or a spiritual contract similar to the exercise contract I referred to? 
Well, most, if not all of us, have already pledged ourselves to one of these. In fact, we renew that contract several times a year. I'm referring to our baptismal covenant, which we renew every time we have a baptism, and at least four times each year, the first Sunday after the Epiphany, which is the Feast of the Baptism of our Lord, on Easter, on Pentecost, and on All Saints Sunday, whether there are baptisms on those days or not. Perhaps in knowing that we have pledged ourselves to continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in the prayers, to persevere in resisting evil whenever we sin, to repent and return to the Lord, to proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ, to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbors as ourselves, and to strive for justice and peace among all people, respecting the dignity of every human being, for that is what we pledge every time we renew our baptismal covenant, will help us to be disciplined to live out the gospel each and every day of our lives. Now, having a set of strategies can be very helpful to maintaining spiritual discipline, which in turn can help us and encourage us to continue to do the work God has given us to do. But it doesn't mean it will be easy. Jesus certainly never promised us that it would be easy. Instead, he uses words like, take up your cross and follow me, and you will drink the cup that I will drink. I'm reminded of a quote by Al Francasa, uh, the legendary football coach at Brother Rice High School in Birmingham, Michigan, uh, which was shared with me by a friend and colleague who played under him in the late 1970s. And my friend said that uh, Coach Fracasso would often uh, utter this phrase at a time when players were grumbling, maybe after a hard practice. And he would say, we don't promise you ease and comfort. No, we promise you pain and agony, but with it, we promise you victory. Likewise, the Gospels do not promise us ease and comfort, but if we persevere in our spiritual discipline, we believe that we will make a difference in the world. That, after all, is what faith is all about. And every difference that we make, even a small one, matters. As words of encouragement, let me close with a couple pieces of scripture from St. Paul, the first from Romans. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast and movable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So, my sisters and brothers, discipline yourselves and watch how God will make a difference in your life and in the world. Amen. Together we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, and the Almighty, maker of
These are the prayers of the people. In the space between petitions, please offer your prayers aloud or silently. Let us pray. Creating God, the rhythms of earth sing of your sustaining care and presence. Stir us to see the divinity of every being, to inhale the fragrance of you in all things, and to engage with you in redeeming creation. One body we, let us feast on the bread of belonging and drink from the cup of love. Glory to you, O God, for the communion of life. <coughs> Most sacred I am, deepen our understanding of Jesus' prophetic words, I am the way, the truth, and the life that we may do the greater things which were foretold. Remind us that our help and devotion are needed for turning the deserts to flowering places. We pray for Pastor Kit on her sabbatical and for Gail and Beth who will be ordained on June 10. Awaken in us, we pray, the Christ imprint on our soul that our minds and imaginations may enlighten for the healing of this hurting world. Glory to you, O God, for the exalted life of Jesus. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, rouse us to a daring and courageous hope. Summon in us the enduring joy of a people who know their belovedness and trust in a benevolent God. Strengthen us to follow Jesus, seeking and speaking always the truth, come what may. Nudge us to choose the path of peacemaker, to listen, to forgive, to bless. Gentle us that by our very being we might reveal a glimpse of a more hallowed way. Glory to you, O God. By your saving grace, O God, our mistakes, our fears, our memories, our histories, our hurts hold no dominion over us. Open our hearts that we may release our burdens and surrender to the living waters of your transforming mercy. Glory to you, O God. Receive our prayers for the suffering of the world and people in need, especially Howard, Marsha, Luol, Lynn, Nell, Jim, <laughs> Mary, Tamara, Catherine, Oscar, Ted, Marty, Emily, Barbara, Folu, Dixie Lee, Kevin, Rosemary, and Jean. We pray also for those who have entered eternal life. And praise be to you for the abundance of gifts so freely given. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people and the multitude of your mercies. Look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Greet one another in the name of the Lord. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Good morning. I'm Tina Hedden, and I'm the vestry person of the day today. The vestry is the governing board of our church, and if you have any questions about All Saints, please feel free to ask me. Um, if you're visiting with us today, please fill out a visitor card. They look like this. These are found in the pew rack in front of you. If you can place it in the offering plate as you go by, um, we'll send you some information about our church. This is the only offering we ask of people who are visiting with us today. Right after service, please join us for coffee and fellowship downstairs in the room directly below us. Um, you can take either set of stairs down or there's an elevator off to this side as well. I have a few important announcements today. One is that Vacation Bible School will be held July 17th through 20th from 9 a.m. to noon. And the program this year is called Hero Central, Discover Your Strength in God. It's open to children between ages of three and entering the fifth grade. Um, and registration is now open on our website. Also, if you're available to help with Vacation Bible School, Becky is looking for helpers, so please consider helping us, um, you know, even just one day from 9 a.m. to noon. Um, and you can see Becky Beauregard for more information about that. Um, next Sunday, we'll celebrate Pentecost, uh, Sunday, June 4th, and is the celebration of Pentecost, the birthday of the church, and is the principal feast of the church, or as some would say, a holy day of obligation. Please remember to wear red and bring a friend to church next week. Um, the third announcement is that we're looking for additional members of our video team. So as many of you know, we've begun videotaping the 10 a.m. service for people who are unable to make it. It's available online. Um, the process of videotaping is really simple and training will be provided. You don't need any special skills. <laughs> Basically, all you have to do is turn on the camera and then you can leave it. You don't need to man the camera during service. Um, but we do need some additional volunteers. And if you'd like to get more information about that, Eric Hegg is the person to talk to. Um, another important announcement is that Beth Bingham and Gail Schaefer will be ordained um, to the transitional diaconate on Saturday, June 10th at 11 a.m. And that's happening at the Cathedral Church of Saints Peter and Paul, um, which is in Detroit. And so I encourage all of you to be there for that if you are able. And I got one additional announcement. Now I need to read it. <laughs> um, oh, help is needed today for coffee hour cleanup. So if you're able to stay for um, cleanup after coffee hour, that would be great. Some additional help is needed. Um, thank you for your attention. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself as an offering and sacrifice to God.
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly we are bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sins of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. As your Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And give us not temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power. are the gifts of God for you, the people of God.
Please join me in the sending forth of Eucharistic visitors. Jean, Terry, Neil, and Sarah. In the name of this congregation, I send you forth bearing these holy gifts that those to whom you go may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We, we who are, are many in one body, because we all share one bread and one, one cup. As you go, may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I apologize. Please join me in the post-communion prayer. <laughs> Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, Savior Jesus Christ and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you've given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses,